Good morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Thank you for joining us today for our devotion time from St. John's Lutheran Church in Berry Mills, Wisconsin. I'm Pastor Schultz, and I'm glad that you're with us today. It is Tuesday morning, December 14th, only 10 days until Christmas Eve. And it's during this season of Advent that we lift our eyes to the Lord Jesus and we rejoice in his coming into the world for us. Let's begin our time together as we dig into God's word for a few minutes by going to the Lord in prayer. We will pray Martin Luther's morning prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The Path of God's Grace During the season of Advent, don't we focus on that as much as we ever do? Looking forward to celebrate our Savior's coming into the world as we rejoice in his birth at Christmas time, rejoicing in why he came, in who he is, and what he accomplished for us. It's all part of the path of God's grace, and it comes to fulfillment and completion in Christ. We've been focusing quite a bit these last couple months on that path, as the Lord preserved his promise, that beautiful promise of the coming Savior, by giving the promise to people and using them to bring the line of the Savior from the very people that he preserved. We looked at people like Adam and Eve, Abraham, Isaac, last week, Jacob, and how the Lord encouraged Jacob as Jacob wrestled with God. Then Jacob had 12 sons. And maybe you recall some of the events. The son that stands out is a one named Joseph. And through a series of events, sibling rivalry, anger, hostility, even hatred, Joseph ended up living in the land of Egypt. And by God's divine hand, his almighty power, Joseph ended up becoming second in command of that empire of Egypt. The people of Israel ended up living in Egypt. They ended up being there for about 400 years. And then throughout the course of history, a new leader of Egypt came into the scene who did not recognize God's people, who persecuted God's people who issued an evil decree, this Pharaoh did, that all the little baby boys born to the Hebrew people should be thrown into the Nile River. There was a special little baby boy that was born. Let's read about him. And as we read about him, we see how the Lord is again working out events in history to preserve the promise of his grace that is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. We read about this special little baby boy in Exodus chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months but she could not hide him any longer. And when she couldn't, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. 
This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. A special little baby boy, born to a Hebrew family from the house of Levi. And remember, there was that evil decree, that command by Pharaoh, that every little baby boy born to the Israelites was to be gotten rid of, thrown into the Nile. Mom and dad preserved him. They kept him for three months. Then it became too difficult to keep him any longer. It would become too obvious that they had a baby boy. So they gave him over to the Lord. They put their full trust in their God. This couldn't have been easy for them to make a little ark, a little reed basket, put him in it and push him into the Nile River. What would happen to him? Would animals attack him? Would he tip over, capsize, and drown? Would anybody find him? And if they did find him, what would happen to him then? Would they do something cruel to him? Or who knows? They were totally acting in faith. They didn't know what would happen. They knew they did not have control. These parents knew that they could not stand up to Pharaoh's decree. So they put their confidence, their trust, their faith in the one who is in control. The one who always has the last word. And the one who is so good, so loving, that he always works out everything to be a blessing. And they took their dear, precious, three-month-old little boy and put him into the Nile River. We are seeing the hand of God in action. And in doing this, he is preserving the path of his amazing grace. It wasn't by chance that this little baby boy came to the family of Pharaoh. When Pharaoh's daughter saw him, when she heard him cry, when we, she saw his need, he was probably very hungry. When she saw this and heard this, her heart went out to him. She pulled him out of the water. And we are told later on in Exodus that as she pulled him out of the water, she gave him the name Moses. Moses, which means to draw out of water. And then we see the hand of God. Remember, the people of Israel were in the land of Egypt, but the Lord made a promise centuries earlier, going back to Abraham, repeated to Isaac, repeated to Jacob, a promise that they would be settled as a people in the land of the promise, of God's promise. And it would be from the land of the promise of God that the promise would be fulfilled as the Savior would come out and redeem the entire world and set the world free from sin and from death. And the Lord would use this little baby boy, Moses, who would grow up in the house of Pharaoh and through many events, a series of events, would be brought back into the land, used by God as an instrument of God, as the Lord would stretch out his almighty right arm and set the people free from the oppression of Egypt and take them, guide them, care for them, lead them, and settle them into the land of the promise. That's the path of God's grace. It's often not the path that people anticipate, that people foresee, that people would even choose. But it's the good path because it is God's path. He took that path, born in humility in Bethlehem, in fulfillment of the promise. He took that path as the Son of God became true man and walked the earth in our place and was obedient and perfect in our place for us. He took the path, the path as he walked to the cross, willingly stretching out his arms, allowing them to be stretched out and nailed to the cross to pay the price to take away our sin, the sin of the world. The path of God's grace is our peace. And as we walk together, through the Old Testament, 
we're seeing the divine love of our perfect Lord God acting in history to preserve his gracious promise. And what makes this so powerful is that love is for you. Whatever you're experiencing, a trying time possibly, or a happy time, the Lord is caring for you, and he is carrying you. The Lord remains your Savior, and nothing can take away the certainty that when he died on the cross, he washed away your sin and mine. Nothing takes away the confidence that when he rose from the grave, he conquered death so that we will not die, but because of Christ, we will live the path of God's grace. During this season of Advent, again, Christmas Eve, only 10 days away. How awesome is that? And during this time, let's focus on Jesus Christ and be reminded that he is the light shining in the darkness. He is the Savior bringing rescue and salvation in this sinful world. He is the one who paid the price to make us children of God, rejoice in that path of God's grace. Give thanks for your Savior, Jesus. Let's pray. Most gracious and awesome Lord God, we look to you and we rejoice. We thank you for using the believers of old to preserve your promise of the Savior, for overcoming their sin, and for setting them free and setting us free from our guilt. Watch over us, protect us from all harm and danger, and constantly keep us in faith. We offer a special prayer, Lord God, for the people, for the families, for all those who have been hit very hard and devastated by the tornadoes in Kentucky and the surrounding states. The destruction is devastating, but you are in control. And we ask you in your power and in your grace and wisdom to watch over everyone who has been hit by this storm, to comfort the families who are grieving, to encourage all the people in their weakness, and to use this as an opportunity so that your word might be proclaimed and that the comfort that is found in you alone shines out in the darkness. Give us the peace and confidence, Lord, to always rely on you and to proclaim you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we thank you for joining us today. A reminder that on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, we will have our Advent Bible Study and Fellowship. Please join us. Also, you are always welcome and invited to join us for worship every Sunday morning at 8 and 10.30 a.m., Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. We have our special services coming up for Christmas. Christmas Eve, we have a candlelight service at 4 p.m. We have a children's Christmas Eve service at 6.30. We have Christmas Day worship on Christmas Day morning at 9 a.m. It's a great joy to rejoice in Jesus, our Savior King. Let's close our time together today with the Lord's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen.